it's important because the main crux of the controversy of this story that so many women take issue with is obviously the English translation of the word rape. And it seems very cut and dry. This is what he did. He raped her. He held her down. He assaulted her. And that's that. However, when we go into the Hebrew, there's a bit of nuance that I think is important to bring out. So I'll go on to some language that is used in the Bible, specific words that are more akin to what we in English refer to as sexual assault and rape. So there's a word in the Hebrew, kabash, which means to subdue, to bring into bondage or under subjection, to force or to subjugate, to trample underfoot. And when I read that definition, what specifically comes to mind is Zora Neale Hurston, if anyone's ever read, their eyes were watching God. And um, Janie's grandmother tells her, and again, this is the protectiveness that we need from the elders. When Janie is kind of exploring, she's coming into puberty, she's feeling herself now and coming into the realization of hormones and emotions. And she's attracted to, I guess, a young man. And, you know, her grandmother seeks to protect her and says, you know, I'm not going to let some young man wipe his feet on you. And I think that language was always, it always stood out to me. And then coming to this Hebrew in the context of Dina or Dinah, that language comes back to mind. You know, we don't want a man to trample us, to walk all over us, to dishonor us and use us. Um, some may even say in even more vulgar terms, you know, just using you and wiping himself off and being through with you. You know, of course, we can imagine without going into too much explicit detail. Um, but we think that in our community, we as young women, we need our elders like Jacob and Dina's brothers to care about us, to protect us from being defiled, used and trampled. And we know even a little old school, the previous generations would call a woman a tramp. You know, and so we think, think about the importance of language and words that even our elders used to use. A woman who was loose sexually was called a tramp. One who was trampled upon, one who was just used like a rag. And men just exhaust themselves within her and get up and keep going. And so when you're made common or discarded, and again, turned out is one of the more modern terms, or even you know, um, even more explicitly, the younger generation may even say slutted out. You know, slutted, he slutted her out. He made her a slut. And that is very vulgar, but we need to understand the type of dishonor that's here, the type of dishonor we allow upon ourselves if we allow a man to use our body without honoring us in marriage covenant. And um, so one instance in which that word specifically kabash is used is in nehemiah 5 and 5 and it says our daughters were forced into bondage or kabash also interestingly enough in the book of esther chapter 7 verse 8 it speaks of haman when he tries to assault her and the king says will he even assault or force the queen even in my own palace and so this is where this word kabash is used specifically in scripture in the context of a forced rape or assault. It, it also has a root of the word to disregard and conquer, to tread down or to make a path, to walk all over, also to press, to squeeze. And so we understand there's many instances of this word also being used in the sense of the claiming of enemy territory, subjugating captives and making slaves of enemies in war. We know that this is also a military strategy. There's another word in Hebrew, shagal. It means to violate, to ravish, to lie with, or to lie in. And a couple of examples, Deuteronomy 28 and 30, a man will violate her or lie with her. Isaiah 13 and 16, their houses and their wives 
were ravaged or lined within. And so what's interesting, going back to war again, we know in war times, the conquering army would rape and pillage. We hear that language even now. We can even hear it in news sources when speaking about war. They raped and pillaged the town. So this not only specifically refers to women and children, it also refers to literally the land itself being defiled, being raped, being pillaged, houses and homes being taken over and destroyed, um, you know, treasures being stolen. We know this is a military strategy, a war tactic to conquer and ravage land and subjects to occupy. And indeed, when a man penetrates a woman, that is also, in a sense, occupying her. And uh, another instance is Jeremiah uh, 3 and 2. Where have you not been violated or lain with? And again, again, Zechariah 14 and 2 says, the women were ravished and their houses lain with. But can you lay with a house or lay in a house? And euphemistically, a woman's womb or her, you know, vulva, may indeed be a home, a house, a sheath. There is even language that the word vagina comes etymologically from the word for sheath, something that you put a sword into. And we know that the man's organ is phallic in nature like a sword. So a woman can be a home to a man. And when we think of proper marriage, the beauty of a wife is that she is a safe space for a man. She is his home. She is his softness. She is the soft place to lay his head in many different ways, literally and figuratively. And even in the Hindu language, the word, and it's so popular now on social media, the word yoni, referring to the woman's reproductive organ, means sacred space. And of course, your home as well should be a sacred space, a gentle space. Um, so that's also interesting. And I also just, in my mind, what's interesting is even in the story of King David, he seduces Bathsheba, whose name means the house, Beit or Beth, Beit means house. So the house of Sheba, we could, we could imagine her name means. And what's interesting is David's son, Solomon, some say, was enamored with the queen of Sheba, the queen of the land of Sheba, which is Ethiopia. Um, so I thought that was interesting as she represents Sheba as the owner or leader, the sovereign of that land. And his father was with Bathsheba, which is the house of Sheba. Um, but now, so now that I've delineated the terms that actually do mean rape and forceful assault, we will see that the words used in Genesis 34 are not those words. So what are those words? Genesis 34 and 2. And when he saw her, Shechem, son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, he took her and lay with her and violated her. These are three words that I will bring out. So the word for he took her is lakah, lakah. To take, accept, to bring, to capture, to carry. And in Nigerian slang or colloquialism, to carry a woman is to take her as your wife or to take her as your love, your beloved. Um, so that's kind of a slang that they use in Nigeria to carry her. And that's like a term of endearment that indicates love. Um, to exact from, to find. We know that he who findeth a wife finds a good thing. Ke get, keep, that word also means to marry, to obtain, to place, to procure, to raise, to receive, and to seize. But what's interesting is we think in English the word seize means, again, to take by force. But seize also means to claim. And don't women desire to be claimed by a man? And so a man claims his prize. If a woman wants to see herself as the prize to be claimed by a man of honor, he has seized her. He has claimed her proudly and triumphantly. And so it indicates by this word that he is captured by her and seducing her seeks to capture her, to capture her heart to speak those sweet words that the scripture says he spoke to her, to 
to select her, to choose her. And we think now, even in social media, how they use the word pick me, you know, speaking of women who want to be chosen, but don't, don't, doesn't every woman desire to be chosen by a man of honor to be seized in that sense to be claimed what what I think, not to what i'm thinking of with it? um sorry what i'm thinking of with um dinah though i mean yes i get that she might have been raped or you know different languages she she might have wanted it she might have been raped we don't really know the story but what i do know is that she never had a voice no one heard what she had to say she never had an opinion mm -hmm. um what did she want you know what i mean because mm -hmm. the chicken came and asked for her the dad i think the dad would have been willing to give her up based on the fact that the guy seemed genuine and so on and so forth but the brother wouldn't have it and before you know it they killed the guy so she still is left without a voice Up to this day we don't know how she felt did she want to be in a relationship with this guy? Did she like this guy? What really happened? Nobody knows. So we can stay here and we we can we can try to determine what the language says or how it sounds or how it appears, but we truly don't know. You know what I mean? And I think that's the part that we're not in the Bible. But the other there are other scriptures that go more in depth in the book of Jasher. It greatly details that story. And although it may not say she specifically agreed to stay with him, there was a period of time that passed. You know, this wasn't just he snatched her up and took her into his house and raped her and then went to her father and said, let me have her. Um, and also his father, when he saw that she would not return, he sent two of his servants to take care of her in Shechem's house while they made these negotiations and agreement. So it would seem that maybe he spit enough game to her, <laughs> you know, he talked sweetly enough to her that, you know, even if the initial um, act may not have been as consensual, we see that she agreed to stay with him in one way or another. Um, so there is an implication that she could have fallen in love with him and agreed to stay in his house because he even sent servants of his house over there to her to watch over her and take care of her while they came to this agreement between Shechem and his father and Jacob yeah, and, and the others. Another so. thing that stood out to me is um, generational cycle. Because if, mm -hmm. if you yes. know Leah's story, Leah never had a say in um, in how she ended up with Jacob. The father just decided to give her to Jacob, mm -hmm. right? Jacob wakes mm -hmm. up one morning yeah. and he realizes, oh, I slept with Leah. <laughs> yeah. She had yeah. no say, right? And, and, and it just goes on to show that we have to be so mindful of generational cycles because just as how... Leah had no say. She didn't get to choose Jacob. Jacob didn't even choose her. She just happened. Like, oops. She was like a oops, right? And then, yeah. sadly, and I'm just being real. Like, the Bible is sadly truthful, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, she, Leah never had a say. Um, Jacob didn't choose her. She, you know, he just woke up one morning and realized he slept with her. And then Dinah, now, the only daughter, um, ends up in the similar situation where some guy snatched her um according to the bible raped her the families are having discussions about this woman she has no say in the matter and then they go ahead and make a decision on her behalf and then you no longer hear about her so it's just a sad cycle you know what i mean it could seem that way but i think there's nowhere in scripture that it says a woman does not have a choice so Although the scripture doesn't specifically say, oh, yes, Dina agreed to, I mean, or Leah or Dina agreed to be with this man. What the agreement was, was that it was not proper in the culture for the younger daughter to marry before the yeah, eldest daughter. Yeah, but it's daughter. still was so, trickery, though. Because, you see, it's yeah. sometimes 
it's not what they do it's how they do it because the father right. know the right. father knew that that was not their mm -hmm. culture the culture was mm -hmm. for the older daughter to get married first but yet he convinced mm -hmm. jacob that he's gonna get um rachel and and, and then, mm -hmm. then he sneakily brought leo leah in the bed like that's deception and you see this but isn't that interesting that jacob deceived his brother and stole his Which birthright is what so then later about this generational <laughs> cycle of deception of women being yeah. um i would say abused because i would say leah was she never had a voice she never get to choose this is the man i want to marry this is the one i want to end up with she never i don't know what conversations might have taken place between her and her father but i just see the cycle of women just being used well i think she loved him because the scripture says she was proud to have his children she wanted him she actually was heartbroken that he still loved rachel more and the scripture is very clear about that she wanted him no, to after, love her she no, after, the fact, to... after she's been with him obviously she's gonna love him now but i'm right. talking about before yeah. the father before the father decided to yeah. give her to him they then they, they had never met you know mm -hmm. jacob met rachel and he fell in love with her instantly and he decided he wanted to marry her um he and leah never had that kind of encounter i think the first time he met leah was in bed you know what i mean well even isaac and rebecca rebecca agreed to go to marry a man she had never seen his abraham's servant went to get her and she agreed you know even though her family asked her to stay so you know even the fact that she agreed to love and marry this man she literally had never seen before in her life and i think in it's a generational thing i think the older generations were more understanding that love grows from marriage you may not fall recklessly in love at first sight but love comes from honor and respect in a marriage and i think that is something that's missing in today's time we think that oh when i see my soulmate i'll know immediately and sparks will fly and we'll have butterflies and be in love but often those relationships that happen like that tend to be the obsessive ones the soul time ones and what's interesting is science has actually shown like that's actually anxiety <laughs> like i like you can read research that shows those feelings the heart fluttering the butterflies um those are indicative of anxiety and so we know that when something comes from god it should bring peace and so even emotionally we shouldn't rush into oh i felt shivers all over when he looked at me um you know when we think about those relationships how many of those actually last versus those that are established in respect and shared values and even in western culture that romanticizes romeo and juliet you know how destructive that was and how reckless that was um and these young people just killed themselves over a feeling basically mm -hmm. versus their family honor and you know a marriage that probably would have been profitable and fruitful and safe for them and secure. But, um, you know, I do agree there is that theme of generational deceit. And um, again, continuing down the line, God does show justice for not only Shechem and the Canaanites, but he shows justice in even how he handles Simeon and Levi and their lineage for what they did. And, um, you know, even what happened to Dina as Jacob's daughter was in a way a punishment for what he did to Esau. So there are many intricacies there that just show, you know, we all have to be upright, you know, and of decent character and not engage in deception in whatever form. I would agree there. Um, but, you know, otherwise, I just wanted to make clear that, you know, there is the question was it rape was it seduction and um i think it is important to look at the language because this is the original language that the bible was written in and god is very specific in the words that he uses um and every word in scripture is written specifically for a reason and if you study even deeper there's so many phenomena even down to the numerological value 
of, and I'm not talking like new age, hocus pocus, numerology type stuff, but just literally when you think of how specific the scriptures are written, um, especially again, in the original Hebrew, where words and phrases, there are no extra words, there's no fillers, there's no accidental words, where there's a mathematics even in the Bible and the words that are written. So um, the words are specific. The word that the, that is in Hebrew for rape or forceful assault is not the word that was used in the account of Dina. And the words that are used are words of obtaining, of getting, of claiming, and alluring. There is the word entice, to flatter, to persuade. And we see that he did do that. He persuaded her. He flattered her. He seduced her. Um, so she, she was humbled. She was defiled still. This doesn't take away the fact that she was defiled. She was defiled and dishonored because he did not honor her by taking her as a wife. He humbled her. And even in English, there are translations that say he lay with her and humbled her. And yes, we are humbled. We are devalued when we give our value away to men in casual sex. Men who do not marry us and honor our families in the right way, who do not even consult our fathers, you know, our mothers, our parents. And, you know, how many young girls, you know, sneak around to their boyfriend's house or even sneak their boyfriend in their mother or father's house. That's dishonor of the highest degree. Um, and it devalues you. And in the end, the man, although he's obviously happy to get, you know, what he wants so easily, in the end, the man doesn't respect that either. You know, men do respect, even when they seek to seduce you, to compromise your values. At the end of the day, it would be better that you resisted him. It would be better that you stood your ground um, and demanded your honor. Men will always respect the woman that does that versus the woman who gives in to their seductions and flatteries. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, she was defiled. She was made common. And that's the specific language. She was made common, made yeah. like a whore. 